Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India speak about the fridge on uh, necessary conditions or the John multiplier rule and from where we will deduce the Kuntakar conditions, but as we will show gradually with examples that uh, in most cases the John multiplier rule gives us what we really require. So, the Multiplier rule John established in 1948 was for inequality constraints because as I told you that earlier the Lagrange multiplier rule uh, dealt with equality constraints though it is uh, you know validity was not established till uh, late um, till in the 60s, but here uh, Frick John studied a problem of this form. We will show that in most cases uh, we will get what we want. So, I will just write down the fridge John condition and then try to explain to you the geometry associated with the constraints and what those things mean. So, this is a theorem. Now, observe one thing, let us assume that all of these are differentiable functions, just differentiable functions. If we have more equality constraints, we have to assume something more that is continuous differentiability, but if you just have this, you have differentiable functions and we will see why it is so. So, let us call this problem as M P at programming problem. Let f and g i is be differentiable maybe I should write on other side of the boat to have space. Let x bar be a minimum. rather a local minimum that is a much uh, better statement rather than just telling minimum. It is a local minimum of M p then there exists lambda naught greater than equal to 0, lambda 1 greater than equal to 0, lambda m greater than equal to 0 such that such that lambda naught, lambda 1, lambda m, this is not a 0 vector and lambda naught, sorry 0 is equal to So, here you go. So, 
The second condition is called the complementary slackness condition. Condition number two is called the complementary slackness condition. In the sense that both these lambda i's and g i's cannot hold with strict inequality at the same time. That is, if g i x is strictly less than 0 and lambda i is strictly greater than 0, then the product would be strictly less than 0, that cannot happen. If lambda i is strictly greater than 0, then either g i x star is um, equal to 0, if lambda i is strictly greater than 0, then g i x star must be equal to 0. If lambda i is equal to 0, then g i x star could be strictly less than 0, could be equal to 0, but if g i x star is strictly less than 0, then lambda i must be equal to 0. So, that gives rise to what is called a set of active constraints. Of course, we will uh, start doing the proof of this, but let us go a bit to the geometry. So, these are the points where the, these are the indices for which the lambda i's need not be 0, may be 0, may not be. So, if all these lambda i's are 0, then lambda naught cannot be 0. Now, a very important fact here is this fact that this multiplier is not equal to 0. If we allow them all of them to be equal to 0, then every feasible point will satisfy the John conditions. The fundamental and the crucial fact of the John condition is this. From the modern terminology, from the basis of, uh, from the modern way of talking about things, if there exists lambda naught, lambda 1, lambda m not equal to 0, with lambda naught greater than 0, we say that this thing, this thing is called the Lagrange multiplier or we in this case are calling it John multipliers. So, we say that the John multiplier is normal. If no such lambda naught, if no such vector bond, no such vector of this form not equal to 0 exists with lambda naught greater than 0, then we say that the, the only possible multiplier is an abnormal multiplier. That is, if the only set of multipliers lambda naught, lambda 1, lambda m not equal to 0, which for which 1 and 2 hold, 1 and 2 hold has lambda not equal to 0, then we say, then we say that the, multi, we, the problem only has abnormal multipliers and the problem has abnormal multipliers. or the good case and the bad case. The good case is that, that it is enough just to have one such multiplier with lambda naught strictly greater than 0. 
and the bad case is that you do not have any multipliers for which lambda naught which satisfies these two and for which lambda naught is greater strictly greater than 0. And uh, it looks that okay, uh, why are you bothered with lambda naught equal to 0 and lambda naught strictly greater than 0, when we have lambda naught strictly greater than 0 you can just write lambda naught equal to 1. So, I am bothered because if lambda naught is equal to 0 then grad f x would have no role. But the important part is that in most most examples which we will start learning maybe from the next uh, lecture, you would not have lambda naught 0 except for uh, pathological cases this abnormality I mean abnormal normal case implies normal multipliers. pathological case abnormal multipliers. Now, let us do the geometry, let us look at it geometrically, what is the normal case and good case and what is the bad case. So, here I would just rub this part which you have already seen or you can roll back the film and see it again. So, G 1 suppose I have two constraints G 1 and G 2. So, here is g 1 x. So, this is the curve giving giving me g 1 x equal to 0. So, I am in two dimensions. So, there is another curve giving me g 2 equal to 0. So, this is g 2 and this is my common zone. So, this shaded region is my feasible set g 1 x less than equal to 0, g 2 x less than equal to 0. Now, suppose this is the point where I am interested in looking into the nature of the behavior of the gradient of this and this, because for example, this could be my solution point and let me assume that there is a this is, this is my solution point. Now, at this point whether I have the good case or the bad case that that is what we have to really decide. Uh, if you look at G 2, this is the surface of G 2 and then, then you really have to have the normal uh, it has to be perpendicular from the surface. So, at this point x bar this is my grad G 2 x bar and at this point if I look at G 1 this is my grad g 2 x bar. So, you observe that these two are linearly independent and now assume that here is the or unconstant minima and here is the level curves, level curves means the set of all x if I take the minima f, f x such that f x equal to some alpha. So, alpha is 0 and then so, but this is our unconstant minima. So, if <coughs> so, from unconstant minima I am just trying to so, basically it is some circular so function a nice convex function basically a paraboloid. It is coming like this, it is coming like here. And there is the level curve and there at this point the gradient of f on this level curve where it is touching and where the optima is achieved on that level curve. This would be my grad of f x because it is perpendicular to the surface of the level curve. 
Now you see how can I represent grad f in terms of this? I can always write that grad of f x bar. So, if I take lambda say positive non negative lambda, lambda 1 and lambda 2, lambda 1 and lambda 2 and add them, let me see lambda 1 grad g 1 x bar plus lambda 2 grad g 2 x bar. Now, if I if because I am taking I have taken a positive multiplication, it will remain on this side and this will be my final linear combination for example. But then this, this, this linear combination here is exactly opposite to grad f x. So, minus of grad f x can be represented like this. So, any, so I can write instead like this grad f x is this. So, finally, I will get And this is exactly the first equation of the John multiplier rule. So, here you see they have a nice behavior, here you see I have got a regular, I have got a normal multiplier, I have I have shown that this lambda naught is greater than 0. So, this thing if you observe comes very naturally from the equation itself, because if you are having this scenario, now you have this scenario, now if lambda naught is equal to 0, It would imply that and because I have to because these are the multipliers which are satisfying the John rule, then and because lambda naught is 0, then lambda 1 to lambda m this vector because lambda naught and lambda 1 lambda m all are 0, but cannot be 0. So, among these one of them has to be non 0. So, this vector itself has to be non 0, which is implying that grad g 1 to grad g m this set of vectors is linearly dependent. Which is implying that this set of vectors grad g 1 at x bar to grad g m at x bar <coughs> is linearly dependent. Now, what does it mean? If lambda naught is equal to 0, these vectors are linearly dependent. So, if these vectors are linearly independent, these vectors calculated at x bar the grad g 1 g 2 g m, then lambda naught is not equal to 0. P implies q negation of q implies negation of p, very simple fact of logic. So, if this equal to 0, these are linearly dependent of, but if these are linearly independent, this cannot be 0. So, which means a natural assumption that I can a natural assumption that one can impose on the constraints is that all these things cannot be the all these the, these vectors are all linearly independent. Of course, when you take linearly independent you have to take m less than equal to n because the maximum number of linearly independent vectors in R n is of course, just n. So, if from the condition itself that uh, what would an abnormal multiplier give me that leads to a way by which we can guarantee that the multiplier is normal. So, once so we so this is so this is an assumption on the constraint which is usually referred to as a constraint qualification.
constraint qualification that if you say that this is linearly independent of course, this assumption would immediately imply that m is less than equal to n is linearly independent whenever you may impose this that this is linearly independent then lambda naught is strictly greater than 0 that is the multiplier is normal. This fact is amply shown here in the picture, because here you see in a two dimensional setup, if the angle between two vectors are either 0 or 180 degree, then the vectors are linearly dependent. Here they are not, angle is an acute angle. So, thus these two are linearly independent vectors guaranteeing that what we have is a normal multiplier. Now, let us see where, what is the situation where we can have only abnormal multipliers, there is no way we can get a normal multiplier. So, here I am just rubbing this part off maybe here. Now, let us look at this situation. One thing says y is greater than equal to x square, another thing says that y is less than equal to minus x square, some sort of thing like this. This is a R2, right? And so this will this will give rise to x square minus y less than 0 and this will give rise to y plus x square less than equal to 0 and only possible solution to this are this is just the point 0 0. This is a typical situation where a linear independence usually fails when you just have one uh, element in the in not always, but one of the cases where linear independence I have a high chance of linear independence of a high chance of failing because if this is my g1 and this is my g2 then this is what I have as and this is what I have as So, these are the pathological cases where linear independence is failing and can lead to non regular multipliers. We will uh, give a more detailed example after we prove the multiplier rule because it needs a lot of things to be done before a multiplier rule can be uh, proved even just for inequality constraints. Then we will give a concrete example where uh, showing that example is due to Kuhn and Tucker in 1951 paper showing that the only possible uh, solution of of the set of Lagrange multipliers, the only possible Lagrange multipliers that will satisfy is the one with lambda not equal to 0. So, that would be very important. Here you can see that grad g 1 and grad g 2 are linearly dependent. And 
see what would happen in this situation because you can always write lambda 1 as minus lambda g 2. So, sorry lambda g 1 x bar is equal to minus lambda or lambda g 1 x bar is equal to minus lambda g 2 x bar. I say lambda is greater than equal to 0. So, you have g 1 x bar plus lambda grad g 2 x bar is equal to 0. So, in that case it, it will really depend on the objective function you can always of course, you will you can always prove that there can be a multiplier with lambda not equal to 0, if particularly put lambda not equal to 0 the inequality is still holding does not matter, but it does not mean that lambda not only would be equal to 0, when there, there is not a situation there cannot be a set of multipliers on g 1 g 2 where lambda not actually is still non 0. So, that is the thing that we are trying to figure out. Uh, we are trying to say that these are the cases where there are high chance of generating multipliers which are abnormal. See what constant qualification does is that it tells you that the multiplier can never be abnormal. So, once you, but in the pathological situation the thing is much more interesting I would say in some sense that in the pathological situation it is very difficult to say whether the multipliers would be normal or abnormal. Of course, in some cases one can show that okay, the only possible multipliers are the abnormal multipliers, they are very bad problems actually. And in some cases even if all these regularity that you are imposing on the constraints do not hold, still the multiplier can be regular and that is a crux that this whole story of regularity of on that is imposed on the constraints which leads to what is called the Kuntagar condition or the constant qualifications. One need not always worry about that because in many many situations even in pathological cases which is coming out in latest last in current research also that even in pathological cases you have lambda naught strictly greater than 0 and in fact in many situations the problem the condition of the problem itself guides you to show that the lambda naught would be anyway greater than equal to 0. So, if you can just find a set of regular multipliers then it is all right and the bad cases are where you cannot find it as a as a regular multiplier you cannot find. <coughs> And you cannot find a uh, uh, not regular find a normal multiplier. So, let us try to prove what we have mentioned. So, what we are going to prove from the how, how are we going to prove the John multiplier rule? What is meaning of a solution even locally? So, for x very near x bar for which this is true and this is true. This is your local minimum for x near x bar. You can understand x very near x means we are talking about a neighborhood and all those points. Now, from here what can I say? So, x is very near x bar then I can replace f x with its uh, linear x approximation that is instead of f x I will look uh, I will write down its linear approximation around x star that linear approximation of a function around a given point x star is
sorry f x x minus x star. So, <coughs> if uh, instead of x uh, a point which is nearby I can write as lambda d for some given direction d x plus lambda d x star plus lambda d. So, x can be written like this for lambda very very small lambda greater than 0 very very small. I think I should write sufficiently small, but okay, just I am writing loosely. Sorry, in gx less than equal to zero. This is the meaning of local optimality. Now I want to replace f(x) here by because x is very near x star. We can replace the function by its linear approximation. Earlier, that is the first order approximation of f around x star. Basically, you write the Taylor expansion and ignore the remainder term. That's the idea. That's the model. So you are replacing the original function, which could be nonlinear by a linear function. For example, sin x is replaced by x. For, for example, those who have forgotten this basic fact, let me look at the sin x graph. So very near x, when x is very near x, its difference with the line y equal to x is very less, but as you go out, if you go more towards this side away from 0, the difference starts increasing. But as you come very near 0, that is why in you will you have learned in say in physics that they always use sin x is almost x when x is very, very small. So, the same idea is been used here. So, what we get here is now g x star plus lambda d sorry. I made a mistake g x should be less than equal to 0, x should be feasible. Please just uh, correct this mistake. It should be that g x bar plus lambda d should be less than equal to 0. So, I am just finding one of the x's. So, one x could be like this um, a point which is very near x and is feasible, feasible means this and is also satisfying this. So, when lambda you take any x d, so if you are not still comfortable with the geometry. Suppose this is your x. So, what I do is uh, a local minimum means that if I take a ball around this and then look at the intersection of the ball with the set and see and add this function point is a minimum for all these points here. Now, what I do if I take this as this as point as x bar and I take any, any direction d then I take x bar plus lambda d which should be like this x bar plus lambda d this is some lambda d this is x bar lambda d is something maybe maybe maybe, maybe this is d and this is lambda d so, so this is x bar plus lambda d but this x bar plus lambda d is outside the this particular set right so here you keep on shrinking, keep on shrinking, keep on shrinking, you can come here, but you can never come come very near. You can come very near to x bar, but you are not still inside here. So, that sort of d I do not want. I want a d for example, if I take a d like this, that sort of a d also would not give you anything. So, I, I need a d where I make this sum. So, if I take a lambda, if, if I take a proper lambda or proper length, I can actually come move along this and come to this point. So, that is why this condition has been written. So, now I am replacing it by uh, its first order approximation which is f x star plus lambda. minus f x star
and here I also write the first order I am just taking 1 g. So, let me uh, just g i g i ok fine. So, for each g i I write g i x star plus lambda it cancels. So, basically I will have there is a lot of deep geometry in involved here, but okay. What I am trying to show here is the following that if optimality occurs then this sort of there must be a D which has to solve this. So, which means if you look at this if there is a D for which this is strictly less than 0 and this is less than equal to 0 which means there is a feasible point from where I can actually make a better move I can decrease the value of f. So, I have not reached the optimal. So, if I have reached the optimal, so I will get something like this. So, which means that this is this strictly less than 0 cannot occur and as we will observe we will show that these two equations cannot occur this system cannot have a solution. So, if x star is a local minima of the original math programming problem and this is this two this system where i is sorry i is belonging to i x bar this system cannot have a solution. If you are uncomfortable with i x bar we can still make it much more uh, easy looking. So, I can say that this system actually this is much more and this system and this is for i equal to 1 to m this system has no solution because if I take i equal to i x bar that is g i x star is 0 uh, I, I, I x star I guess. Okay. So, because I, I am giving x star because x star was the symbol are given in the main result. So, here g of if I take i x star is equal to 0, because if i x star is strictly less than 0, then it, it is quite simple to do that, because if, if g i x star is strictly less than 0 and this is strictly less than 0, then both of them are strictly less than 0 if there is such a d which satisfies this. But if g i x star is equal to 0, then I can just put here as put the g i x star equal to 0 and get, get just this part. So, this system does not have a solution, this is what we need to show. And here we gradually get into the more deeper depths of convex convexity and we have to talk about separation theorems and all those stuff. So, uh, let me uh, tell you one thing tomorrow we will start by proving this. Now, after I prove this you might ask me okay, well, how do this, this is such a difficult thing how can I show that a system is inconsistent it is not so easy to show that a system is inconsistent possibly it is easier to solve a system rather than showing a system is inconsistent. 
So, we will first show that if this system is inconsistent, what is consistent? Is there anything consistent where which you can actually compute? To do that, we will need to talk about separation theorem. So, first we will talk about this and in order to say that if this is inconsistent, what is consistent? What is the corresponding system which is consistent? The inconsistency of this would should be equivalent to the consistency of something else. So, we will show that in order to do that, we should learn about convex uh, of course, you know about convex sets a bit, about separation theorems and the Gordon and the theorems of the alternatives which will finally, lead to the John multiplier root. So, here we are making a step by step study and we will start giving a lot of examples and we will show that actually in most cases the multiplier rule gives you normal, normal things and we will in fact, do a lot lot of examples in this course. Thank you very much.